Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Sherrard Show. I'm your host, Sherrard. Hope you're doing well on this Saturday, May 2nd. Today we have a very, very special show. Today we're going to be speaking to a man, a very fascinating individual. This man has gone from being the biggest drug dealer in Los Angeles in the 80s to serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, to being illiterate and learning how to read when he was 28 years old, to getting his freedom and becoming a very successful businessman today, Mr. Freeway Rick Ross. We're also gonna be talking about his life, his legacy, as well as where he stands today. You don't wanna miss this episode. And for all those who can't see this live broadcast, you can always see it on Apple TV, Roku, as well as Amazon Fire Stick. I'm Sherrod, I'm very excited, I hope you are. And when we come back, we're gonna have Mr. Freeway, Rick Ross. are doing wonderfully well on this Saturday morning. We have a very special show, as I mentioned a moment ago. We have a gentleman, a very fascinating gentleman that stopped by the show today. This man has gone from being one of the biggest, if not the biggest drug dealer um, in the Los Angeles area in the one East, each. to going to prison um, with a life sentence without the possibility of parole, to learning to read at the age of 28, to getting out and becoming a very successful businessman and he's here to tell his story today, as well as what he has coming now and what he's doing today. Welcome to the show, Mr. Free Ray, Rick Ross. How are you, sir? What up? What up? I'm good. It's so good staying, to see you, sir. It's been staying, a while. Staying while. quarantined. <laughs> how, how is that working out for you? Well, you know, uh, the first couple of days was a little rough. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I ain't used to being in the house. I'm used to flying around the country. You know, it's funny you say that because every time I would uh, call you, you were in a different city and you were speaking to people all over the city, um, all over the country, actually. Um, what were you speaking about when you were visiting all these different cities? Well, I stopped doing that because I would be high risk now, for catching now coronavirus. Uh -huh. I would be high risk for catching coronavirus. Now, before the coronavirus hit and you were um, speaking, what, what were you doing? You were professionally speaking, uh, motivating youngsters. What were you doing? Well, you know, I got an interesting story. And if, if somebody, I don't, and, and let me, this is me talking, so mm -hmm. I can't say if somebody did the actual research that they would find the same conclusion that I come with. But, uh, I go out and tell them how a guy could have been a genius, but the system had tricked him into believing he was a drug dealer that and, a, and, a, uh -huh. and an illegal drug dealer at that. that not, not only should he sell drugs, but he should be selling illegal drugs instead of legal drugs, you know, sell illegal drugs. Don't go and do the research to find out how to make legal drugs, the drugs that they allow you to sell over the counter that you could put a sign up and have run an ad on TV and say that you sell. Um, and does have side effects to me. Most of them have side effects. Now that's but he didn't think you say that. Now, now, before we get into that, let's, let's talk about um, the past and how you arrived to the point where you are now. Now, which past? I got a lot of passes. <laughs> now, let's start off with the ones that most, many people are quite familiar with, and some people are going to become... And which one is that? I don't know which one that is. Well, let's see. Let's see. I think people should know me now more by having a number one documentary on Netflix for a year and a half. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now, now, your documentary on Netflix is speaking about your past as well as where you do, what you're doing currently now. Yeah, you clever. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you're real clever. You keep getting back to that past. Now, the thing is, though, the, the interesting but, thing about... But I've done that, so much in the future. Uh-huh. Now, that, we, that we, I don't know if that past is, is as big as it used to be. Uh-huh. And, I mean, in, in the scope of things, yeah, yeah, okay. Esquire magazine did an article on it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it got me this other article. Well, let me get that article. Hey, my... 
Can you hand me the LA Magazine article? And, Please, and I'm it, sorry. And that was actually an excellent piece written on Oh the my God. The LA Jesse, well. Jesse Jesse put his heart into that article. Uh-huh. He spilled he spilled out his heart in that article. I mean, he really like his friend was gonna die in prison. Wow. See, he became I'm so contagious. <laughs> now, why do you say you're contagious, Rick? My mentality is contagious. Mm -hmm. Look at now, what look at what I've done to hip hop. Analyze hip hop. Really break hip hop down and look at the influence that I've had on hip hop. I've heard that for many years, and it's amazing that so many people say that, especially with uh, one of the biggest rappers out there taking your name, huh? Is that, is that what one of the things you're speaking about? I mean, that's part of hip hop. Mm -hmm. Is that my influence on hip hop? Majorly, majorly. Did, did, I, did I influence that guy? Is there anybody on the planet that will argue that I influenced him? And not, not not saying that he needed my name or nothing like that. There, we're not not we're not going to even go in that argument. Uh huh. Uh huh. Did I have any influence on him? Oh, that's quite apparent, Rick. You had a major influence on him um, because people don't know him by his first name. They know him by the name that he took from you. This is my immune booster. Immune booster, immune booster. So, uh, <laughs> so when people talk about my past, then I would have to say my influence on hip hop. Or uh, my influence on the courts. You know, I made the United States government let me go. And how did you do that, Rick? I learned how to read and write. See, 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 I didn't know how to read and write when I was in high school. Right? Mm -hmm. I was probably the dumbest kid in the class. Now, now just because... Or everybody you... thought. Or everybody thought. Right. Because, see, what I figured out now is that little Ricky, who couldn't read and write, figured out how to get to the 12th grade without, <laughs> being, able to read, without being able to read and write. Uh-huh. See, he wasn't important with the steps that it took. He was just worried about getting to the point. See, a lot of people, they be worried about the steps that you take. Right. So, so my thing is, Rick, now, you were, you were a big sports person growing up and in, um, in playing sports in um, grammar school, high school, and things like that. Because you love tennis, is that correct? I love tennis, but I also love football. Mm -hmm. Now, what position did you play as a football player? Quarterback, of course. And some wide receiver, some wide receiver. Mm -hmm. And then on defense, I would play safety, cornerback, or linebacker, or uh, defensive end. But your favorite position was being a quarterback? I never really played organized football. But it, you know, in a I uniform, saw, in a I uniform, saw, we, 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 that was very interesting is that you were so good at tennis that they, Arthur Ashe actually played a few rounds with you. Is that no, 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 not true. Arthur, no, Arthur Ashe, Arthur Ashe came down to our high school. We had one of the best high school tennis teams in the, in the country and without question, the best black tennis team in the country. He came to the school and he hit with my friends on my tennis team. Okay, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Uh, I don't even know if I was good enough then to even get in the picture. But the guys who were my best friends took pictures with Arthur Ashe and hit tennis balls with Arthur Ashe and one almost won a set off of Arthur Ashe when Arthur Ashe was number one in the world. Wow, wow, now this was in the 80s? No, this was in the 70s. Oh, wow. Wow, that's, that's pretty honorable. Um, like 74. Because uh, I didn't even know who Arthur Ashe was before that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, um, how far, how far, Rick, did you take your uh, tennis career before you uh, decided, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore? I played a couple years at a junior college, L.A. Trade Tech. Wow. So now, I got a lot of games from tennis, though. <laughs> tennis gave me game. You know, really? when I now, was, when I was, when I was, when I was like 16, I used to get to go play tennis with rich kids. Cause I was I was a little sixteen, you know I wasn't you know six five I was like five four so I probably looked like I was like twelve. So rich people who play tennis, who kids play tennis, they hire somebody like little Rick, who played like a sixteen year old, but he looked like he was a twelve year old. So they would take him out and let him play their twelve-year-old kids, who they plan on making pros out of them. And and they would go against you, and it would make both of you all better. Is that right? Well, yeah, they would get more out of it than I would. I would get cash, mm-hmm. you know, like a twenty-dollar bill. But not only that, now some other perks. I would get to go and play in the backyard at a, at a Beverly Hills mansion. I would get taken back to L.A. in a Rolls Royce. So, tennis was teaching me stuff. You know, I was seeing wealth. Uh, just just so much exposure. But then, I, I took, I took, I got some new babies, right? Mm-hmm. They're going to be like Venus and Serena. They, they say they hate tennis, though. Cause they think I love it. Anything I love, they don't want it. <laughs> Crazy. Now, now but, these are your these are your daughters. My daughter and my son. Oh really? I really. So you getting them groomed? You can see them in the LA. They in the LA magazine article. Yeah. Wow. You know, and, and that's what I want to talk about in a minute because um, so one of the big things you're doing, you're transitioning. You said that now that you're you're an advisor to some big names, um, growing names in the sport of boxing. One particular person is um, Austin Trout. Is that correct? Yeah. And um, you also have a, a couple of Olympic um, gold medalists that you're also advising. No, on. not medalists yet. They're going. They they on the Olympic team though. Mm-hmm. And, they, they, they haven't won the medals yet. I mean, they, they don't want gold for all kind of other stuff. They're like uh-huh. they, they they prominent kids. You know, I, I wouldn't mess with them if they wasn't. Uh, Tiger Johnson, uh, uh, Joseph Hicks. And Lupe, Lupe, uh, what's Lupe last name? You know, I don't speak Spanish well. Lupe Glopa, I think it is, something like that. I, I don't know. I can't pronounce her last name, but it, it's a Spanish Spanish young lady. Uh, 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 and I'm just, I'm just advising them on how they should uh, navigate their careers uh, through these, through these, uh, and that's what I've been wanting to do, because that's what I always did. You know, that's what I did when I sold cocaine that everybody think was so special. You know, all I did was figure out how I could do it myself. And then once I figured out how to do it myself, I just taught all my friends. And then mm-hmm. I would teach anybody else that listened. Mm-hmm. So you until, were, you were... until I got so big that I didn't want nobody else to listen. <laughs> so... Being, you, so you you feel in your life basically you've always just been an advisor, um, putting your knowledge, giving your knowledge to people so they can become better at what they do. And yeah, that's what, that's really all I do. I'm, you know, like my contract with the fighters is gonna say I'm their personal assistant. You know, I'm here when they need me. You know, and, and I'm a friend. You know, I'm the kind of guy that if you call at four in the morning, it's crazy. You, you know, they're doing my movie right now, right? So me and the writer was talking the other day because I told him what I'm doing right now is, is going to be when people find out what I'm doing right now, people are going to be You know, you got a drug dealer running around with one of the best doctors in the world. Dr. Leslie Ray Matthews is one of the coldest doctors on the planet. And when I found out that he was not working on this pandemic that we having I was hurt and I would wonder is the only reason that he's not working on this thing is because he's black 
Is that the only reason he hasn't been on CNN? Now, um, Rick, what makes him one of the most fascinating and best doctors you ever met? His track record. You know, his track record. Is, I mean, the guy went to Morehouse University and they had a 12% uh, death rate and he turned into 3%. So, so he feels that he can be able to um, cure this pandemic? Not feel. He says he knows it. Wow. And this is coming from a credible... This is not coming from... Uh, no disrespect to nobody. But, you know, the, the herb doctors, and he's not one of them. He has a degree in chemistry from Ole Miss University. Graduated top of his class. And, and he's putting out, um, he's, he's getting the message out that he can do things about it? Or is he, um, he, he, he is a little, he is a little, but he's not, he's not a marketer. So I'm, I'm assuming that's where you come in to be able to um, help him out. Well, I'm, I, I'm trying. I'm trying. We need it, Rick. We need it. You know, so many people are dying. This we need it. People can just come up with. Well, our... you know, well, you know, but we at the age of the, of the Donald Trump era. You know, going hunches, hopes, and wishes, and not science. You know, you know, Rick. Um, one thing that um fascinates me about you. We were talking um earlier this week. You were mentioning about how um. You know, and I'm not going to mention any names, but you were just mentioning how certain people have become, you know, very, very well off, um, rich and billionaires. And you really scratch your head on how they became that because you you were saying they really aren't thinkers. Um, but you credit yourself for being the thinker. You've always been a thinker. Now, elaborate a little bit. On no, I want to be a thinker. I don't know if I'm a thinker yet. But I want to be one. You know, I, I, <laughs> I try. I try hard. See, some people don't even want to be a thinker. And the first thing you got to do is you got to want it. And then when you find out that your greatest asset is your mind, and if you don't use your mind wisely, others will use it for you. Now, at what point did you learn that? Did you learn it early in life or did you learn it um, later? When did you learn that? That's what it is. I don't know. I don't know. When I was in jail, I got I, I learned a lot about me when I was in jail. You know, I thought that cocaine made me who I was. I thought that I needed cocaine. And that it would be hard for me to do anything else without cocaine. And I missed a lot of opportunities because of that. But you were making mega things happen. I mean, at the age of 24, you know, you were richer than... Um most people could ever dream of. So how could you say you're missing other opportunities? Hmm. One of my best friends used to be the guy that they just did the documentary on. They call him the Godfather, the Black Godfather. Mm -hmm. But one of my best friends was his personal bodyguard. And he used to call me and he said, hey, Rick, come up and meet Clarence. And I'd be like, I'm in South Central. Tell him to come down here. So many people that he could have introduced me to. My other partner who also was worked with him, who, who went to high school with us, he was Don Kinesis' personal bodyguard. Really? And became a producer of Soul Train. So I'm just going to run a few things down so you could see why I wonder sometimes if I'm really a thinker. Mm -hmm. But I noticed that I put myself in the position with the way I think, but sometimes I don't close the deal. Uh, my other boy, Reginald Relifer, who just passed recently, was a, was a producer of Extra. Uh, also, he was a producer, Soul Train. He came, it was his idea for the Soul Train Awards. He, he gave Don, Don Kinesis that idea. Um, 
What else? Mm. DJ Pooh. You know who DJ Pooh is? Yeah, from Friday, right? Yeah, he wrote Friday. Uh-huh. When he was about 17, he was really good friends with one of my girlfriend's cousins. So sometimes they would stay over at the house. He asked me to produce his album. He took me to a place where there was all of these rappers and producers and whatever in this apartment building, but it was not that nice looking. It looked worse than my crack houses. And he wanted me to give me the money to do his album. Well, when I got out of prison, Dr. Dre said he was one of the guys in that apartment. Wow. So that's how close I was. So that's what you're meaning when you say you missed a lot of opportunities doing that? Absolutely. I also gave Otis Smith the money to produce Anita Baker's album. Otis so, Smith is the guy that used to pick me up. One of the guys who kids I used to play tennis with. Now, um, when now, how did you meet Floyd Mayweather? I met Floyd Mayweather through a guy by the name of Rob Garcia. Not Mikey brother, Rob. Uh, but Rob, Rob was a... a um, Rob was Floyd Sr.'s assistant. You know, like... Whatever Floyd don't want to do, like hold a mitts or whatever, he'll do it for, for Floyd, you know, because Floyd Sr. is the man. You know, he got somebody to help him do everything that he need done. So uh, Rob worked with, with Floyd Sr., you know, with Delahoya. He, he, he's a dietitian, too, so he does their they meals and everything for him. And Rob is cold. Rob with me right now. Me and Rob work together right now. We... we he, he gonna have all my fighters for, if, if he not their trainers because they all got their own trainers but he gonna be helping them with their diet you know how to eat right how to keep your weight up because Rob is a real he got his degree in dietitian you know he can take your blood and, and tell you what what, what uh, minerals you need so like a lot of people don't know that, that De La Hoya and Floyd had all that when they was when they get out they know all that stuff they got high tech uh, and so I know I gotta be high tech too I got to be doing what everybody else is doing, but just a little more, just a little better. Now, Rick, what got you into uh, getting into the fight game? Uh, two things, really. Uh, we was all at Caesar's Palace one time, and and Don King walked up and he shook everybody's hand sitting at that table. He knew we had spent a lot of money. <laughs> That would do it. So when 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 uh when when I went to prison and, and I thought about that day sitting at that table, I said, what would have happened if I'd have walked up to Don King and said, Man, I got three million dollars. Let's go. Now now Don King is out of the game just about as a promoter, is that correct? He's still trying. Uh I spoke to his daughter the other day. Uh but, you know, he, he don't get it. You know, I, I tried to go and work for Don King for free. How did that go? He didn't hear me. See, I missed out on the opportunity when he walked up to that table. See, he would have he he went with me then. So I told him I had that $3 million. But when I came back to make up for that mistake that I made, and I gave him the opportunity. He turned me down. Well, did he give you a reason? Nope. Because I didn't need no money. I was going to pay my rent. He was just going to have somebody that, like, like my boxers got right now. See, they got a guy right now that if they need him to play center, and take some hits, he'll do it for them. If wow. they put him on the end and say, this your pass, 
He going to do it for them. If they say, go play quarterback, that's what they going to do. That's what Don King would have had. One that ain't going to steal from you. No, nah, he ain't going to steal your money because guess what? He don't really care about money. He could have sold his movie rights as soon as he got out of jail. They offered him eight hundred thousand dollars. You know who would testify to that? Who? Irv Gotti and Chris Gotti. Wow. Both of them will testify that them people offered me eight hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I turned it down. Now, when you when you got out of jail, Irv, did you have any money? Mm mm. I was broke. I had dignity, though. <laughs> so, so Amari started my Amari started my looked out. Amari started my looked out. Wow, wow. Now, now how did you know? How, how did you know Amari? I met Amari through another one of my partners, Jack Frost, who knew uh, Amari's uh, manager. And they all came up. They came up to the halfway house in San Diego because I wanted to go to the halfway house in San Diego to kind of ease my way back in, you know, not be around everybody. And they came up in that limo. Man, that thing was long. Boy, that thing was long. One of them Hummers. Mm-hmm. And Amari stepped out of there. Amari cool. But Amari just wouldn't allow me. Well, you know what? Amari was being close to me. But then when he signed with Happy Waters now, they, they was kind of hating on me. Because you, you know, I was going to take our distance each other, yourselves from each other. I, yeah, I, I think that's what all of these dudes do. You know, that their their agents and their managers, and and their their companies. You know, because see, if they be around me, they're going to be talking about buying a basketball team. See, there, that's that thinking. And then, and then they're going to be talking about, oh, I want to be the president of the league. Why not me? So, and uh, now, uh, and now I'm gonna go to China and make a deal directly with the companies in China. I don't need no middleman, really. If I wanted a pimp, you know, I go on Figaro. And I ain't no Figaro ho, so don't treat me like one. <laughs> so, so Rick, um, and excuse my French. Yeah, yeah, I didn't know you spoke French so well, Rick. I'm, I'm shocked. But Rick, uh, let me ask you a question now. Two things um, very important to me. Now, for those who are just tuning in, we are speaking to the fascinating, uh, very wise, uh, Mr. Freeway Rick Ross, who's um, doing some big, big things now. He's, hey, uh, that's what that boy said in Cocaine Politics. I, I didn't really know what to make of it. He said even though he spoke to people who won Nobel Peace Prize and all that, he said, but out of all the people that he spoke to, I was the sharpest one. That's what he said. I was like, hey, come on, man. Don't you know I didn't I didn't graduate from high school or junior high school or elementary. They just passed me through. Doesn't matter. You got the, you got the common sense, because common sense isn't common. Now, now, Rick, um now that you're in the boxing and you know you now you're doing the camera. Music, movies, you're doing music as well. Now what, what capacity are you in the music? Books. Um, I got some really big friends in it. So you're you're like a um you're you're the CEO. Uh, are you basically managing? No, I'm gonna put all the money up because I'm gonna have more money than than sin. I'm in the cannabis industry too. Right, you, correct, correct. You know, look at this here. This this is my this is my pre roll here. You see that? Jeez, Louise. No, they didn't know. They didn't know. Let me see. L.A. Kingpin, baby. <laughs> can, can you see it? I can't see it. Oh, there we go. There we go. And my, then, my goodness, Rick. What are you, and what are you then, trying to pull? And then, you know, this here. You know, that there. And then, and then, let me tell you the, the other crazy part. They had the nerve to give me a dispensary. Come on, Rick. Only in America, huh? That ain't even all of it, right? Because you know me, I want to be, I want to be around the homies. I want to make sure the homies get their issue. Right. Right? That's where I want to be. 
So where's your dispensary? But guess where they put me at? Right in South Central? No. I would have been out of they the gave me what I wanted. They didn't do it. And I say thank y'all. <laughs> <laughs>
to stay relevant for all these years, you know, from the BET American Gangster series, you know, uh, Reginald Hutland did that. And Reggie also the guy that's, that's, that's producing my movie too. When is your movie coming out? I don't know. We wrestling right now. The, the writer thinks that it should be two movies. And the people with the money uh, think that it should be one. But if things go the way the way I think they're gonna go, you know, might come out once once I get rich and I, I pay for my own movie to be produced, and then I'm gonna do two movies because I, I believe that it could do two movies. So so Rick, tell me why or three you, or why three. Do you want to do, do it as a series or you want to just have do it on a big screen? No, the one? series would be separate. Mm-hmm. Are they uh, somebody one a producer called me the other day and they were saying that uh, Narco Mexico. They mentioned me in the, in the show, not by name. You know, they never mention my name. Like Snowfall, you know, they change it to Frank. Yeah, Snowfall is your life. I mean, that that's is my life. So, somewhat, thing. somewhat, somewhat. It's not totally my life, but it, it, they they hit some points. <laughs> you know, they change it up a little bit. Pretty iron. It's pretty ironic, but you know, based upon the setting and you know, how things start off and things like that. Now, who do you plan? Who do you want to get to uh, play you? Um, in your movie? I don't know. You know, I've been, uh, I've seen a few things that kid, uh, Kim gonna kill me for saying this too. You know, Kim Harding is the casting director and the producer as well. Mm-hmm. You know Kim? No, I know of her, but I don't know her personally. Okay, yeah, she casts all the big movies, all the big black movies, Baby Boy. Matter of fact, she casts at Snowfall. So, uh, she's, she's one of the top Cast and directors, and for sure in the black community. Uh, but I, I like the guy Childish Gambino. Oh, really? I like Childish Gambino, and I think with him, I think with him, my movie would do a billion dollars. Wow! Wow! Yeah, That's if he played my role, it would do a billion dollars. Well, Rick, get me in there as a detective. I'll play a detective in there, okay? I can't do any casting. <laughs> I can't make any recommendations. You know when I got out, when those guys offered me the money, and this is like the four most powerful guys in Hollywood, uh-huh. Michael Linton, Ori Manuel, Spencer Boomer, Jeff Bird. They all said that the reason that I couldn't be a producer is because I would cast all my friends. And they, they, were they telling the truth? Not about me. Not to know that was the wrong thing. No, I would never do something that I knew was the wrong thing for me to do. Mm-hmm. So what I did is I said, you know what? I have absolutely nothing to do with casting. Wow. Well, I'm definitely be looking forward to it. And I'll, no worries. I'll, I'll work it in where I can at least be. Well, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to let everybody know when they start casting. And I'm going to go to a few cities. I'm going to go to you. And I'm going to bring Kim with me. That'd be awesome. So people are going to get to see who Kim is because they see her movies and they know they're her actors and all that, but they don't know Kim. Mm-hmm. But Kim is a hell of a person. Wow. Please and I ain't just saying that. I ain't just saying that because it's crazy how things work, right? Because I done had a couple, you know, I done had a couple options on the movie. You know, people gave me some money to uh, uh, have the right to take and shot my movie. Mm-hmm. I done did a couple of them little deals. And I was telling them, like, oh, I want Kim Harding to be the casting director. Because, you know, I'm a fan of Kim's. I ain't going to lie to you. Uh and they, and they, wait a minute, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. And they be like, ah, no, nah, we're going to get somebody better. And these are, these are, you know, and then it's usually a white person. And so I was like, ah, oh, man. But, you know, they got the money and they optioned it. So they got, so the deals fall, you know, they don't get it done. So then Reginald Hudlin come. And, uh, he started doing it. They take over. And then one day they call me. And it's like, hey, uh, we got Kim Hardy. I was like. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I got exactly what I wanted just by being patient and waiting. And sometimes, you know, sometimes our dreams take time. You know, sometimes you might have a dream 30 years, take 30 years for it to come true. Now you're preaching, Doc. That is absolutely correct. But it came true. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Um, you know, it's amazing because being from Chicago, um, you know, one of the biggest drug dealers in my time was uh, Fluky Stokes. You know, um, he, I knew Fluky. You knew him? Not personally. Yeah, but you know him? Yeah, he was really, really big time. In they time. buried him in, in a Cadillac. Yeah, exactly. Sure did. They sure did in like 1989 or so. That sure yeah. happened. But um, yeah. he, was, he was big time um, in terms of that. And then, you know, um, uh, Lucas, for example. Now, you were, you know, I'm sure you know him as well, Frank Lucas. I, I met I met Frank uh uh Minister Louis Farrakhan did a drug summit and he had me and uh Frank speak. So that's when that's when I met Frank. Wow. So that's but you know it's amazing because look at you now, you know, Rick, you have businesses everywhere. You are um, doing movies and you know your record company and you have your own like dispensary and you know, you're traveling around the world, at least you were before the um, COVID-19 in terms of um, speaking to the youth and things. Um, how does that make you feel, this side of life now, that you're so much more educated and wiser from back in the 80s um, when you first started doing what you were doing? I could have been did this. I always had this in me. But I had no directions. I was being guided by my community. Why, by the things that they thought were important, important, by what looked good from everybody else's eyes, I was made to believe that it was good. And it took me uh, really sitting down in prison and reading 300 books, uh, getting a life sentence without the possibility of parole studying the law like a madman and to get a good set of judges to be sitting where I'm at right now. How long did it uh, take for them to actually even re re retry a case or even listen to you? Uh, normally appeal takes like 18 months after conviction. Uh, you know, you, you could take up to three years going to go to trial um uh, after trial you could get postponements up to a year you know before sentencing after the jury finds you guilty uh my trial took two weeks of testimony um after conviction 18 months you you should get a a, a appellate hearing in my situation it was a ninth circuit court of appeals um after you have that hearing, four months after that, you'll get a ruling. Usually four months after that. Some could go longer. Get a reversal, you can go back to court. You could be in there any amount of time. Up to another three years before you get resentenced. So. Wow. But also in my case, you know, I had a, a crooked INS agent that had forged the paperwork to my informant's Paperwork. They should have. They should have threw my whole case out behind that. But my my lawyer missed. Uh, he didn't put the the INS agent on the witness stand. Had he put the INS agent on the witness stand, it would have been a, a agent of the government that lied instead of a witness of the government that lies. See, if you're an informant and you lie, it's no big deal. But if you're an actual agent of the government and you lie, big big deal. Because you're supposed to function at a different uh, credibility level. And had my lawyer put him on the witness stand, he would have definitely lied at the time. Wow. So that's, Rick, that's your research. All those uh, books and things of reading, your research found out that era that your, that your attorney missed? It did. It did. And then as I better started to understand the law as well, 
you know, I just didn't understand the law as soon as uh, I started doing law. It took me a, a while to adapt. And that kind of taught me something, too, that I can mold myself to be whatever it is that I want to be. I mean, you know, we just talked about me, and then now look at this here. It's my book. This is my other book. So, now, where's it available for purchase? They can get it at my website. Don't go to Amazon because Amazon don't need our money. Uh, you can go to freewayrickyross.com. Uh, I'm here. I'm gonna get them out fast because I ain't running around the country. You know, sometimes y'all order my book, I be in another country, another state, another country, and I can't get it right back to you. But I'm sitting here now. You're gonna get it fast. I'm gonna autograph it the same day I get it. I'm gonna put it in the mail the same day. So you can go to Freeway Ricky Ross or the book. Uh, don't order no t-shirts because I can't get to them there in another office. I can't get to those right now. So don't <laughs> order no t-shirts, please. Um, and you should follow me too on my social media. And, uh, and what's that so it can appear on the screen? What's your Facebook? Your Freeway Facebook? Ricky on uh, Instagram and Freeway Ricky Ross on Facebook. <clears throat> my Twitter got hacked. Um, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, man, it's it's you know it's an interesting thing, and uh, it's very very interesting. You know, uh, Rick, um, I really first of all appreciate you being on the show. You're so busy, you got so much going on. Um, I got Teddy Riley to today. You You've been able to do for me, yes, sir. Oh, I, I was trying to say I got Teddy Riley today on my Instagram. Oh, really? Yeah, Teddy Riley gonna be on in my Instagram today. Is he battling um, baby face? Not on my Instagram. Mm -hmm. Only way we're gonna be talking about baby faces, uh, baby faces on there. <laughs> no, we're gonna be talking about me and Teddy, how we met, and uh, how Teddy saw me grow, and you know what he's doing now, and uh, probably be talking about how the pandemic affects him, affected his career, and how he's dealing with it, and you know maybe asking what guys doing, and, and the rest of the fellas. What time is this on Instagram gonna be? I don't know. The flyer should be up on my social media. Okay. Okay. So so Rick. I don't um, keep up with none of that. I got people that do everything for me, man. My team gets so you know, when I first started off, I had the bad new bears. They couldn't kick, couldn't catch, couldn't punt. They was just the numbers. But my team is getting so strong and, and so good. Um uh, I mean, just like how I was able to to get these Olympic fighters, man, is 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 monumental. But all I did was, uh, you know, did what the books told me to do. You know, make sure you cop in the right cat. If you cop in a cat, make sure you cop in the right one. And and that's what I did. And and I'm doing it. And and, and I'm starting to get the results that uh that I'm gonna get. You know, I wish I wish I would have been in position to fund this uh, program that Doc needed funded for this uh COVID virus cure that he got that nobody uh were bad uh but you know this country is not functioning off of uh logic right now you know any logical person would say let's get the brightest minds together and figure this out i don't care if they from china from india uh from the shithole this country as he said in the world Let's get the brightest minds together. We don't care where they come from. We don't care what color their skin is. Let's just solve this problem. And then if you want to, if you're foolish enough to go back to hating because of the color of somebody's skin or where they're from, then you go back to that and be miserable and hateful. But me, I'm enjoying this life and I'm going to live to the fullest and I'm going to help as many people as I can. Cause I get a kick out of it. Huh. You well, well, Rick, I really appreciate you helping me. Uh, Rick, let me ask you one last question because um, our time is about up. But now, what? I have a lot of um, nephews, family, um, friends that are fans of yours, and also that look up to you, especially from the big things you're doing now. Uh, but for those who um, like to dive into the mischievous or the, or the street life that they feel is so appealing and feel that it offers so much for them, what kind of advice would you be able to give to those youngsters? Well, if they listen to your tape, they're going to hear it because they could be cheating themselves. My man said, why cheat yourself when you could be treating yourself? You know, um, when I got into the dope game, I was treating myself to 
a life of bondage. It's it's just something that sucks you in altogether from being addicted to the streets and selling it to the people using it to going to prison. So, but if that's what you're looking for, sell cocaine. If you're looking for money, like I was, I was just looking for money. I was just looking for freedom. There's other ways and ways that you can make a whole lot of money. And Uncle Rick will teach you. Follow me on Instagram at Freeway Ricky, Facebook, Freeway Ricky Walsh. I got you, baby. Let's do it. Rick, we really appreciate you stopping by the show. Um, and also look forward to having um, your boxers on the show as well. Um, Rick, and also um, definitely make sure this is the book. Now, you owe me an autograph, Rick, but this is the book um, that started it all. Um, Rick, I was privileged to read this book and have it back in uh, 2015. And I so much thank you. You definitely want to read it um, from the streets of L.A., to being an educated man um, doing big things to this day. So, Rick, we really appreciate you being on the Sherrard Show. You be safe out there, man. And, and I'm going to stop autographing them pretty soon. Yeah, <laughs> well, well, hold one for me. I definitely going to I got you. I got you. Autograph for that. I'm going to stop you. autographing them so the value is not going to be there because I'm not going to autograph many more books. So you better go ahead now. Let me know that you heard me. When you heard me, because some dates is going to mean something on there. It's going to show me how wise you caught on. Because, you know, also I'm starting a show where I'm going to be helping people uh, finance their business. I think it's called Looking for Game or Finding Game. I don't know what. Now I don't keep up with names. But anyway, on, on that show, I'm going to be helping people uh, get their businesses off the ground, including uh, even putting money up for them. Really? Uh, what is this going to be coming out? We're already doing it right now. We're just on there talking. We haven't went to that level. This is only like maybe the first week. So right now we're just chopping game. But uh, our next move is going to be, you know, financing people's businesses. and Because, you know, everybody's out of business now. So they're going to need somebody like me who can show them how who, you can get out of prison with 200 bucks and, and, and take over boxing in less than 10 years. So we need somebody that can show everybody how to get their businesses back going with nothing. And, and you know, with me, if I would have been the president, though, I would have just stopped everything for, for three or four months. You know, hey, no more rent, no more mortgages, no car notes, don't pay insurance, don't do nothing for, for, for four months. You know, everybody take a loss. Because if, if you look at it, all the money does is generate. The money is just supposed to circulate. So... Uh, with, with nobody really losing any money or really gaining nothing, you're going to be in really the same position you was in when the market collapsed, almost, if they would have stopped everything. Wow. But it's it's a lot more complicated than I make it sound, I know, because, uh, uh, you know, people got other countries invested over here, but uh, really the whole world should have took that approach because money is just a tool. I appreciate it. Rick, um, thank you, my brother. You made my Saturday morning. We really appreciate you again being on the show. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your Saturday. We will be talking soon. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the uh, iconic Mr. Free Ray Rick Ross. We live? The show. It's an icon. Living legend. We, we live? Yes, we are. Tell him to go and watch, come watch my, my, my uh, Teddy Riley today, man. And, and, and they just log into your... Um, Instagram, is that correct? Yep, Freeway Ricky. Check it out. See him talking to the, uh, Teddy Riley about what they're up to, what he's been up to. And also, you may be able to even see Teddy Riley bust a note, ladies and gentlemen. You don't want to miss that. Just check out Freeway Ricky on Instagram. Freeway, enjoy the rest of your Saturday. We'll talk soon, my brother. Thanks again. All right, cool. Bye-bye.